Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are so glad to have you with us this morning for a behind the scenes look into our fossil lab. So this is the second of four special webinars to explore our fossil lab and make sure your teacher caregiver signs you up for our next one, which will be April 12th, I believe. I have that date written out later on. Um, my name is Becca and I work with the education team here at La Brea Tar Pits. And as you can probably tell, I'm not at the museum right now. I'm at home like many of you, but we do have some amazing staff that still need to go into the museum to help take care of our fossils. We will try to get to as many questions as we can, and Connie and Steph might answer a lot of them during their presentations. But if we don't get to answer your question today, I encourage you to write it down so that you can learn more about our lab on your own. So if you'd like, grab a piece of paper and a pencil so you can record your experience while you're watching today. You can not note down any of those questions that you have, maybe a few facts you've learned or draw or write a description of what the fossil lab looks like. And we love fan art of our program, so if you have a picture you'd like to share with your teacher, they're welcome to email it to the school programs team. So today, we're going to start off hearing all about asphalt, what it is, where it comes from, and how it traps animals with fossil preparator Connie Clark. And then Steph Potts, the manager of the fossil lab, will be joining us from inside that fossil lab to demonstrate how we clean off all that sticky asphalt and prepare our fossils for display or storage. Hey Connie, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much, Becca. Um, I'm really excited to be with you all here today because I love asphalt. I think it's really, really cool. And it's the reason we have all of these fossils here today. Um, so asphalt, uh, if you've ever been to the park, you might've seen our asphalt seeps. It's this gooey black liquid when it comes to the surface. You can even find little bubbles as it's bubbling up. And we can also see in this seep here, we've got really nice little asphalt seep just right across the street in the park. But what is asphalt and where does it come from? Well, asphalt is the heaviest and crudest form of oil. And so it's coming from oil uh, deep underground. But where does that oil come from? That oil is from ancient oceans. So 20 million years ago, uh, Los Angeles was underwater and little microorganisms that lived in the water called diatoms lived and died there. And so as they died, they sank to the bottom. And then over time, sediment like rocks and clays from the mountains sort of washed down into the ocean and covered up those diatoms. And then over even more time, as more sediment piled on and as different tectonic forces acted, that those diatoms experienced heat and pressure in just the right amounts to be able to cook them into oil. And so that leads us to today where Los Angeles is no longer an ocean, we're above ground and we're sitting on a lot of oil fields. And so the tar pits is in this really sweet spot where we're on an oil field, but we also have a fault near us. So a fault is sort of a crack in the earth. And so that fault allows the oil from underneath to sort of bubble up to the surface to form our asphalt seeps. And these seeps may not always be obvious. So this is one of my favorite seeps in the park. It's in the Pleistocene garden. And it's really hard to see. It's not as easy to see as when it's just spilling onto the sidewalk or the road. Because it's in our garden, it's covered up by a lot of leaves and sticks. And it's actually this whole area right here is just thinly covered by a couple inches of asphalt. And so imagine you are an ice age animal, maybe a mammoth. You're looking at all these really tender, tasty willow leaves here. You go over to give it a bite. You step in the asphalt and you're trapped without even knowing it. But how does the asphalt trap all of these animals? Uh, that's a really good question. And it has to do with sort of the properties of asphalt. So I'm gonna try to, oh, thank you. Um, so to demonstrate why asphalt's hard to escape, first reason is that it's a really thick and viscous liquid. And so viscosity is the measure of basically a liquid's ability to flow. So if something has a low viscosity, like this water in a jar I've got here, it can flow very easily. It's not very thick. When I turn the jar around, it instantly flows to the bottom. A more viscous liquid, like honey, Honey is about a thousand times more viscous than water. So if I turn it over, it's gonna to start to flow much, much, much more slowly than the water did. 
asphalt is a thousand times more viscous than honey. So if I flip it over, you can see not much is happening unlike the water and the honey. Um, so we could be waiting here all day waiting for that asphalt to drip. And so this really thick liquid is really difficult to sort of move in. So if you've ever tried to stir water versus stirring honey, you'll know that it takes a lot more work to stir that honey. And so once an animal's in the asphalt, trying to move through that asphalt is really difficult. The asphalt is also really sticky. And so stickiness can be thought of as two different forces, which I have a little demo for you here today. So there's adhesion, which is basically stickiness to other things. And there's cohesion, which is sort of stickiness to itself. So on this paper, I've got a piece of ABC gum that's already been chewed. And I've also got a little dollop of slime. Maybe you guys have played with slime before. These are both sticky objects, but they behave a little bit differently. So if I press the paper together and then try to pull it apart, you'll notice that the gum is stretched across the paper, whereas the slime is mostly on one side. So it didn't, a whole, not a whole lot of it traveled across. And that's because they have different sort of adhesive and cohesive properties. So the gum really likes to stick to the paper. So it's stickier to the paper than it is to itself. So when I pulled that paper apart, the gum just sort of stretched across the paper. So it's got, it's got greater adhesion to the paper than it does cohesion to itself. Whereas the slime, it sticks to the paper, but it's not as sticky to the paper as it is to uh, itself. So when I pulled the paper apart, the slime mostly stayed where I put it over here. So it's got a lot more cohesion or stickiness to itself than adhesion. And asphalt is really tricky because it's got great cohesion and great adhesion. So the asphalt sticks to itself really, really well, but it also sticks to other things really well. So if you think about stepping in gum, you can usually pull away from the gum with your shoe and the gum will break. So it doesn't have enough cohesion to stick together to sort of trap you to the ground. And if you uh, played with slime, you know, you'll play with it and it's pretty easy to unstick it from yourself. And that's just, it's just not as adhesive. It's not as sticky to you. But asphalt is both adhesive and cohesive, um, and which means that if an animal gets stuck in the asphalt, it has a really hard time getting unstuck from the asphalt. And it also has a really hard time breaking the asphalt away from itself. So asphalt is a really great sticky substance that really can trap animals in just a very tiny amount. Just an inch or two of asphalt on the surface can trap some of these large, large animals. But asphalt doesn't always stay sticky and gooey. So once that asphalt comes to the surface, a lot of the times it starts to dry out and harden. And so what started out as liquid and gooey can become really dry and hard. So this is some old aged asphalt. It's got some rocks in it and it is very solid and crusty and hardened. And so this is the material that we're trying to clean off the fossils in the fossil lab. So I'm gonna pass it over to the lab manager, Steph, to talk about how we do that. Buenos dias, friends, and thank you so much, Connie, for that awesome explanation on asphalt and the properties that make asphalt so unique. I'm coming to you live from inside the fossil lab. It's one of the reasons why I'm wearing a mask today, because I'm sharing this space with another colleague, and we don't want to share our air. We have to ensure that everyone is safe in this space. But I'm coming to you from the fossil lab so that I can give you a real time explanation and introduction into how it is that we remove the asphalt from these fossils we find here at the La Brea Tar Pits. But first I'd just like to tell you that the La Brea Tar Pits is a really special place. It's one of the largest collections of ice age fossils anywhere in the world. We have over 3 million fossils in our collection. And our lab is rather special and unique too because we're one of the only labs in the world that prepares asphalt the way we do 
um, here in this specific fossil lab at Rancho La Brea. Now, as Connie explained, asphalt is quite a unique material. And what happens is when it reaches the surface over time, it no longer is sticky and gooey, but actually hardens to form that tough crust that we find. What I'm gonna do is show you over here what a fossil looks like when we receive it from our excavation team. You'll notice that it's got, the bone has that hard, crusty, fossil asphaltic matrix. And matrix is a term that we use here at Rancho La Brea to explain a mixture or a combination of the sediment or the sand that was in the ground, as well as the asphalt and anything else that might be trapped in this asphalt along with the bone. Now, when Connie showed you that her favorite seep here in the park in the Pleistocene garden, you would have noticed that there were leaves collecting there. So when an animal gets stuck, it's not just the animal and its bones that get stuck in that seep, but a lot of things that are found around it. So there would be leaves and twigs from the plants, and also there could be insects um, and other remains of creatures that also lived and used that area that made contact with the asphalt and got stuck in there. So it's almost like sticky fly trap paper in a sense. But here in the lab, we have to clean and remove this hardened asphalt. But we have to be very careful when we do that because we don't want to cause any damage to the bone. These are fossils, so they are very fragile and delicate. And we also want to make sure that we do not scratch or cause any injury to the bone itself so that we do not impact the study of the science. And how do we do that? Well, we actually use chemicals here in the laboratory. We use degreasing solvents like this Novik 73DE. And why do we use degreasing solvents? Because as Connie explained, asphalt is a byproduct of crude oil and degreasing solvents break down the oil component in the asphalt. And when the asphalt has become hardened and encrusted the bone, like we see here with this fossil, what we try and do with this chemical as well is that we try to reliquify the asphalt. So we try and make it runny and sticky again so that we can remove it. Now, safety first, whenever you're working in a chemical laboratory. And so we need to make sure that we are wearing gloves to protect our hands and our skin. And we also wear safety goggles to protect our eyes so that if there's any splash of the solvent or chemical, we know that our eyes are protected. And then you'll also notice that I'm wearing my white lab coat. This protects my clothing and my body from any of the chemicals that we are working with. I'm going to show you a variety of tools that we use as well when we are removing the asphalt. Some of them might be quite familiar to you. We use toothbrushes quite often. And yes, we do use the toothbrush when we are cleaning teeth. They work very well to clean the teeth of saber-toothed cats and dye wolves. We can also use paintbrushes. We like to use toothpicks to work at getting some of the very stubborn little rocks and sediment that's sticking to the bone. It just helps us to move them along and encourage the process of removing the material. We also use Q-tips like you see over here. And then sometimes we use some more lab related materials. So I've got a pipette over here. We can use the pipette if we want to suck up larger quantities of that solvent to apply to larger areas of the fossil that we are cleaning. And then because I said earlier, our fossils are extremely delicate and we want to be careful, when we are dealing with very fragile specimens, we like to use our foam tip applicators. So there's actually a Q-tip underneath, but you notice it has a lovely foam covering. So why do we use this instead of not only using the Q-tip? Because sometimes a fossil can get damaged uh, during the preservation process and there can be jagged edges and the fibers on the Q-tip can grab onto those jagged edges and can either pull the bone or leave behind a lot of these cotton fibers on the Q-tip. But when we use these foam tip applicators where the Q-tip is covered with the foam, 
the foam is extremely gentle on the bone surface and won't grab onto any of the jagged or damaged areas. And then we also have smaller foam tools that we use. You'll notice we have one that has a conic uh, conical shape, like a cone, it's got that sharp point, and one that's got a more rounded tip. And we use these to get into little areas that our larger instruments cannot help us with. And then lastly, we also have this foam tip applicator that has a rougher texture on it. And this just helps us deal with some of the stubborn areas, almost like you would use a sponge when you're washing dishes, just to help you with those stubborn areas to get the asphalt off. You might have noticed that the majority of the tools that we use in this lab are also wood. We strive to be a sustainable laboratory as well. So we have replaced most of our single plastic with wood and bamboo in this lab. Now I want to introduce you to the specimen I'll be preparing today. And this is mushroom. Mushroom is a nickname given by Laura, one of our excavators, to this American badger skull that she discovered and excavated from box 14 associated with project 23. We know it is an American badger because of the shape of the skull, but most importantly, because of the teeth. Teeth are almost like fingerprints for species. And so a specific species has this very specific pattern on the tooth. And from that, we can determine who we are looking at and who we are dealing with. What's remarkable about this specimen, mushroom, and American badgers here at Rancho La Brea is that we do not have a lot. This is the first skull ever found. And that's quite impressive because they've been excavating for over 100 years here at Rancho La Brea. And like I said earlier, we have over 3 million specimens in our collection. This is a very delicate specimen because you can see here at the top of the skull that it's got a few cracks running through it. And again, this is just damage that is um, uh, happens during the preservation process while the specimen is still um, in the ground before it is excavated. So I'll be putting on my safety glasses. You'll see that the solvent is pretty clear. You'll notice that my tool is nice and clean. I'm gonna dip it into the solvent and I'm gonna start preparing the specimen. Now what you'll see I'm going to do is I'm gently applying the tool onto the asphalt. And what's happening is do you notice how my tool is actually changing color? What's happening is the solvent is liquefying the asphalt and in turn, the absorbency of the foam is absorbing or sucking up that liquid asphalt. And this is a process I will continue to do. Let's clean some of that off. See, I dipped it into the solvent. The solvent has taken most of that asphalt. I can start cleaning the specimen again. Let's see how it is liquefying that asphalt. And this is a slow process. We have a saying in the lab that you need time to study time, so we do not rush the preparation of our material. When we are cleaning skulls like mushroom, it can take me close to two months or a month, depending on how fragile and delicate the material is to completely remove all of that asphalt. And here what I just like to show you is what a specimen looks like once it's been completely cleaned. So here is the hip bone or a nominate of a dire wolf that I cleaned last week. And this is all the matrix or sediment that was surrounding that bone that I was able to clean away. Now, the next step would be to look at this under the microscope and sort through all those little grains of sand because there might be some lovely microfossils trapped in it. And that's exactly what you are seeing here behind me. To give you an idea of how tiny these microfossils are, I've put a one cent coin in the corner for scale. And here you can see the O, the N and the E. So these are really tiny fossils. That's why we have to work through a microscope to try and see if we can find And I'm just briefly gonna to touch on what you have in here. We have a leaf. We 
would that Hey, Steph, sorry about that. It seems like you froze. Oh. Oh, pop of a dinner. And then we have Shell as your differences in color with the microphone. That is just because of makeup of the material. Oh. Oh, there you are. Hey, Steph, sorry about that. I think we lost you during the micro microfossil portion. Sorry about that. Some techno gremlins here at the museum, but I'll finish up here. Okay. The last that I want to show you is the shoulder blade of a dire wolf. And you'll notice that it is in two pieces. This is because it got damaged during preservation, but they fit perfectly. Let me get it in place. They, and so what we can do is we can use an adhesive, like adhesion. It's something that sticks to another thing. And we can use this adhesive or special glue called Paraloid B72 to join the broken pieces together before we send it through to our collections team. But we'll discuss adhesives and glue next time um, as a, in a bit more detail. But yes, this is what we do here in the lab to remove the asphalt from our fossils. And I really hope you found it informative. Um, and yes, over to you, Becca. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steph. That's so fascinating to be able to see how strong that solvent is in removing all of that sticky asphalt. It's just amazing. Um, we have a ton of really great questions coming in, and I'm actually going to bring Connie in as well, too, because we have some questions about asphalt and adhesion and cohesion. Um, so. Karis is wondering if you could kind of explain how the asphalt gets from deep underground up to the surface. Um, can you can you speak on that a little bit? Sure. So uh, once that asphalt and that oil is underground, uh, we've got a lot of tectonic activity in the area. So the earth is moving. You've probably felt earthquakes here before. And so that movement can sort of crack the ground and that gives it that, that oil a way to sort of float up to the surface. So much like a cooking oil floats on water, oil is much less dense than rock. And so it actually sort of is more buoyant and it sort of wants to go upward is the way to say it. So it's as if it can find a way to escape to the surface, it will, it'll just sort of make its way upward and form our asphalt seeps. Awesome, very cool. Thank you for clarifying that. And then we had another question about the adhesion and cohesion and the differences with that. So Sophia mentioned that she's played with some slime before and it was really sticky. One of it got stuck to her fingers. So she's curious if that was more adhesive or cohesive. Could you explain that a little bit more for us? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, so that would be a case where it's more adhesive. So if the slime got stuck to your finger, it's it's sticking to your finger and not to itself quite as much. So maybe when you pulled that slime away, a bit of it left got stuck on your finger. And yeah, a lot of substances have sort of a mix of adhesive and cohesive properties. And so when, for instance, scientists are making glues, that's one thing they have to balance really carefully. So you want the glue to stick to something else, but you also want it to hold together so it doesn't break apart from itself. So um, yeah, this, it's a very tricky blend and each substance is a little bit different. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for clarifying that for us. So we also have another question. Steph, we're wondering um, the fossil that you were holding at the start of the of the presentation. We're wondering what um, what kind of animal that was from and what bone that was. Good thing. Believe... Is, it, is it this one over here? Yes. So that's a great question. You've got um, some, some good students in here wanting to know a little bit more about what we are looking at. So this is most likely a thoracic vertebra of a direwolf. So we find a lot of direwolf fossils here at Rancho La Brea. It's our most common occurring species of mammal that we have over here at La Brea Tarpet. And what exactly do I mean when I say a thoracic vertebra? Well, the back bone or the spinal column is broken up into distinctive groups so that you can identify specific shapes and structures associated with it. And the thoracic vertebra means that it is the part of the backbone that is responsible for our thorax region, which is where our ribcage is. And 
It's got a very long spine coming up here for muscle attachment, but also it's got these little shelves on the side. And this is exactly where the rib bones rest on this backbone or this uh, vertebral bone so that it keeps our ribs in place to protect our heart and lungs and internal organs. Oh, very cool. So you said it's probably that, that fossil. Is that going to be something you can tell for sure as soon as you get all of the asphalt off of that bone? Indeed. Indeed. Okay, okay cool. Thank you. Um, so we have another question here about the asphalt. And um, Samantha's wondering if that asphalt is harmful or toxic to people. Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so it's definitely not good to get it on your skin. It's very, very tough to get off your skin. And um, it's not terribly toxic, but it's not good for you. So, you know, asphalt is actually all around us. So it's the road you drive on is made of asphalt. It's a pretty common substance. So it's not too dangerous, but it's definitely not something you want to breathe a lot of, and it's not something you want to eat or touch, um, but it's not inherently dangerous. It's a, it's a tool that we use. Uh, the Native Americans here used it to waterproof baskets and so, you know, and to fix things and we use it for roofs and roads. So yeah, it's a substance, not too much is not good for you, but that's true for a lot of things. Definitely, moderation is the way to go for most things. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we've got Maya wondering about um, if bugs can get trapped in the asphalt. I think we did talk a little bit about that when you were talking about microfossils, so maybe some of that got cut off. But they're also wondering um, if the bugs would be hardened by the asphalt. So asphalt is extremely interesting material to find fossils in. So usually when we think of fossils like dinosaurs, for example, of which we find no dinosaurs here, this is purely ice age, so nothing older than 50,000 years. Um, we often think of bone that has turned into rock, so it became mineralized. And that process is when the most abundant mineral in the sediment that is covering the bone requires water to transport it into the bone, and it starts to mineralize the bone. So all that negative or empty space in bone, it starts to get replaced by the mineral. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have heard the saying, oil and water doesn't mix. And asphalt is a byproduct of oil. So what happens as soon as the asphalt coats the bone of the animal or an insect or a leaf or a little lizard or a snake or even the shell, what it does is it immediately starts to protect it. But water cannot get through that oil to start replacing that material with mineral. So by the time we remove the asphalt, we are actually just sitting with a very old bone, which is 50,000 years old, or a very old insect leg. So it's not become hardened or mineralized like in the classic sense of fossilization. But the asphalt is remarkable in its preservation. And that's why we have this amazing collection of microfossils, such as the insects, the leaves, and the reptiles and small rodents. It's because when something gets coated with the asphalt, the asphalt protects it. It's like a little time capsule it starts to create. So UV light from the sun can't break it down. Water can't get in it to break it down either. And that's what's so remarkable about this material we have here at Rancho La Brea, is we have an entire ecosystem represented in our fossil record. And in some cases, when you find things like dinosaurs, you don't always have the plant and insect material preserved because the conditions don't usually allow for that. But here at the uh, La Brea top, it's because of the asphalt and how it protects them. We have a great representation of an ancient ecosystem pres presented here, which helps scientists to recreate what the past looked like and also to understand how climate change impacts different species more or less um, when, when climate changes um, and they have to, to fight for different resources. That's amazing. You can tell so much just from something so small. Um, I, I love hearing about all of this work. It's so exciting. Um, I think we have time for one more question. It's actually two questions in one, but I'm going to try to put them together. So 
Uh, Rayan is wondering if it's possible to clean asphalt with very hot water. You're talking a little bit about that oil and water mixture issue. And then Aiden's also wondering if that asphalt can melt if it's cl close to something hot. Yes, yeah, so those are excellent questions. Um, we need to have some kind of um, uh, chemical in our solution to be able to break down the asphalt. So hot water uh, won't necessarily break down the asphalt um, and we wouldn't want to use too much hot water because we also have to be careful about the bone chemistry as well. Also the plants and the insects that we are finding. But we, um, we use the, the, the uh, degreasing solvents which has a specific property that breaks down the oil um, and, and that's what we need. And can you just repeat the second question for me again? Yeah, they're just wondering if the um, asphalt can melt if it gets close to something hot. So it, it does respond to friction. Um, so it's probably how animals also started getting trapped. We've noticed with asphalt, it, the more you work with it, the stickier and gooey it becomes. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have watched programs on how fossils are usually prepared on National Geographic or something. And in most cases, they use a little mechanical tool called an air scribe or a zip scribe. And what that does is that instrument, it's like an engraving pen almost, or a dental drill. It slowly chips away at the, the hardened uh, sand that's covering the bone. We've tried to use that here before. And the problem is the kinetic energy that it creates, creates heat. And what happens is that heat starts to soften up the asphalt and gunks the instrument. So we spend more time actually cleaning the instrument from the gunky asphalt than preparing the material. And then also what's difficult when you're working with asphalt, why we can't use that method is the asphalt completely obscures any of the material in it because everything that is coated in asphalt takes on that black color. And so we can't always get a good visual of what we are working with if we are using tools like that. So it's much safer and more controlled for us to use a chemical where we just gradually and slowly remove the asphalt first before we actually remove the material such as the sediment or the microfossils. Oh wow! Thank you so much, both of you, for sharing all of your all of your expertise and knowledge with us. This has been so wonderful. We've still got a lot of questions coming in, but unfortunately, we're running low on time. So I'm going to close this out here again. Thank you so much, Steph and Connie, for joining us this morning. Um, I want to share a couple things with everyone who's who's watching with us this this morning. Um, we. If you want to see more from our fossil preparators, you can give them a follow on Instagram. Uh, their handle is at the La Brea Tarpets. And you can also view all of the videos from these presentations on our YouTube channel to watch later. You can catch this recording and others at youtube.com forward slash the La Brea Tarpets. And thank you all again so much for joining us. Um, we hope to see you again at our next Inside the Fossil Lab session where staff will talk us talk with us more about um, about those adhes ad excuse me adhesives and what we do to repair the fossils if they are broken when we find them or if we break them while we're working on them um, which I'm sure you'll be asking about as well so that's going to be on April 12th at 10 30 a.m. you can ask your teacher or caregiver to sign you up and we hope to see you then thank you all so much again have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time